Stop right there, Dr. Connors. What are you doing to those gr- What the heck? Oh boy, yeah. How'd that get in there? It was the end of an era after Spider-Man 3 released in 2007, gaining mixed reactions from both audiences and critics, not bothering Sony at all as it was still a financial success with them wanting to move forward with Spider-Man 4, bringing in Sam Raimi and Tobey Maguire to introduce the Lizard, Vulture, and Black Cat. However, studio meddling that happened in Spider-Man 3 was happening once again with Spider-Man 4, prompting Sam Raimi to leave the franchise and Tobey Maguire being a loyal boy deciding to go with him, thus creating one of the fastest reboots in cinema history only five years later creating a new franchise the amazing spider-man a title i'm kind of happy they chose with and a good way to differentiate themselves from the toby world i was a freshman in high school when they announced that they would be rebooting spider-man and so i was following along the process in the same way i do now with my youtube channel i was looking at leaked set photos i was finding out who got cast as gwen stacy the lizard of course even spider-man himself with me being very hesitant on the decision for Andrew Garfield because I was like, this boy's 27. Did we learn nothing from the big old middle-aged cast of the first Spider-Man franchise? But thank freaking goodness for a little movie called The Social Network that I decided to check out opening weekend solely because Andrew Garfield was going to be Spider-Man and I wanted to see what this guy was capable of. And son, let me just roll the damn clip that convinced me. Mark! Mark! He's wired in. Sorry? He's wired in. Is he? Yes. So now that I was on board with this actor and team involved with the new Spider-Man, all that was left to do is for high school me to check it out. And well, let's just go ahead and hit play on Amazing Spider-Man from 2012. So with the opening for Amazing Spider-Man, we get a title card sequence that is extremely short compared to the Sam Raimi world, where it's just the new title with some webbing. But with a reboot, the thing you always want to do is something different, and they definitely do that here with starting off with Peter Parker as a child. This is one of the big selling points for Amazing Spider-Man, Man, as it was being branded the Spider-Man movie that would tell you the untold story of Peter Parker. And what I think was a promising way to go for the new movie as it would make it different from what came before as we never really got to see Tobey Maguire as a kid or heck even his parents. Sadly this whole subplot of the untold story for Amazing Spider-Man I'm not a huge fan of. Some of you might not be aware of what they're implying here but with these scenes and the information that his father Richard Parker was a genetic scientist for Oscorp and the close-up the spider was all supposed to be part of a subplot that implied Richard Parker was experimenting on young Peter Parker and is what would help him gain his Spider-Man powers later on in this movie. Yeah, I'm not lying. That is something they wanted to do with this movie and there's even a deleted scene that made it more clear that was the case. This is flawed. It was working quite well on you. Did you ever stop and wonder why? Do you have any idea what you really are? I'm happy they deleted that scene, that way we can kind of pretend that that's not exactly what they're going here, but still, that was the intention in this movie. Ignoring that part of Amazing Spider-Man, I do like the sequence we get where Peter is now in his Uncle Ben and Aunt May's house, where us, the audience, can already tell what's about to happen to Peter's parents, having us already emotionally connect to this Peter with the way his mother says goodbye to him. There's my crust on his sandwiches. He likes to sleep with a little light on it, man. No bringing us to a sweet transition of Peter now becoming a teenager. Now again, this is where we get something different from Tobey Maguire's world because it's been a decade later. This version of Peter Parker took a lot more inspiration from the Ultimate Spider-Man comics, where Peter Parker is more of a loner and outsider and is just more bullied for keeping to himself and being that quiet kid who sits in the back of the classroom. Not just that, but you also add in the fact that he's a skater, I thought was an interesting little choice that I could have had with or without. But I think this choice to go with the socially awkward Peter Parker that is obviously super handsome, way more than Tobey Maguire. Tobey Maguire was a sex machine in my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> Still is. So you will always be Spider-Man and you cannot take that away from me. Um, no matter who fills those shoes, it's always going to be Tobey's role. So don't you dare. 
Whoa, 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 go, go, go. I'm sorry, Papa Andrew, you're right. But as we're following more of Andrew's version of Peter, we also get to meet the new cast of characters they decided to add on to this reboot with Emma Stone as Gwen Stacy, which is probably my second favorite casting choice out of the entire Spider-Man franchise. Emma Stone's acting paired up with the chemistry for Andrew Garfield is what really sells at home the amazing Spider-Man franchise and makes me love these movies so damn much. Same way they did a super comic accurate version of Flash Thompson here that I think so far is my favorite version of Flash. Stay down, Parker! But watch one more! I wouldn't want to fight me neither. Exactly. Bringing us now to the home life of this Peter Parker and his interactions with Aunt May and Uncle Ben. Where man, were these two choices so controversial for the time people thought that this Aunt May was way too young to be playing the part. Ooh, little would you know, that ain't how young they can go, son. And this choice of Uncle Ben, who is the real life father of someone who was very chaotic back in 2012. It's like winning. And while I love the Ben in the Sam Raimi universe, the chemistry between these characters also phenomenal. You really sense that this couple has been married for a long time that even though it seems like they're fighting, they're still smiling, getting along, as well as showing how wise this Uncle Ben is and the love they have for Peter. But now that we've met a lot of the main characters for this movie, we move forward with continuing to tell us about that untold story for Peter Parker, where Peter here finds a briefcase that belonged to his father that contains a lot of little clues to Peter's father's past life. And again, it's the little details in Amazing Spider-Man that I really like here, how they really kind of go the extra mile to show Peter's intelligence. The fact that they have modernized this character where if he is struggling with eyesight, he would be someone who has contacts. But us as fanboys would love a traditional Peter Parker with glasses. So the fact that he would put away his contacts to put on glasses that belong to his dad make a lot of sense. And even just the little mechanical lock on his door, again, shows you how much of a little tinker this Peter is. From here, Uncle Ben does decide to go check up on Peter as far as to even telling him a little more information about what that briefcase means and the context it has inside. To where again, the amazing Spider-Man just nails it with the chemistry between characters I don't have much education, you know that, Peter. Hell, I stopped being able to help with your homework when you were 10. Uh, Uncle Ben? Yeah. You're a pretty great dad, right? I wish Toby could have had these heartwarming situations with his uncle. And I know I'm not your father. Then stop pretending to be. But now with Peter learning the identity of Dr. Connors and the connection he had to his father, he decides to pay a little visit to him in Oscorp. It's here where the movie even starts doing a little world building and teases Norman Osborn, who is only there through a silhouette, something that excited the crap out of me as a fan and like, yes, they're not gonna start off with Green Goblin right away. They'll save him for the future. So much potential and promise with Norman Osborn only to be later disappointed. But now Peter's sneaking his way into a tour for Oscorp, he sees that Gwen Stacy, his classmate, is leading it. Coming in contact with Dr. Connors where we get a rough breakdown of what exactly his motive will be in the movie, and that is to regrow his limbs using lizard DNA, and what Spider-Man fans will know will not turn out pretty. But that's not even the beauty of this scene, because even six feet apart, COVID rules, Andrew Garfield and Emma Stone's chemistry is oozing off the damn screen. He's one of Midtown Science's best and brightest. Wait, second. You sure about that? I'm pretty sure. I'm afraid. Look, movies are subjective and everyone has a different opinion, but if you don't get a big dumb smile on your face or a little fuzzy feeling in your heart when you see these two talk to each other every time in this movie, you're never gonna find love, man. Are you following me? No, I'm not, fo no, I'm not <laughs> following you, no, I'm not. I had no idea you worked here. Then why would you be here? Bringing us to Peter sneak around Oscorp in search for what his father was working on, deciding to walk into a room filled with spiders everywhere. Let me just tell you, love Spider-Man, hate spiders, I don't know anyone in their right mind that would even step two inches into that room. But here is one of my criticisms for the movie where I'm not a big fan of how Peter Parker got bit by a spider here just because like I was telling you, how has no other scientist been bitten by a spider here and gotten Spider-Man powers? Sure, you could tell me they wear protective lab coats from head to toe, but there is still gonna be some error one way or another. So the only other explanation was that Peter already had something built into his DNA that his father put in there so that when he got bit by a spider, his DNA could easily fuse together with it. But as Peter Parker is gaining his Spider-Man powers, we cut to a scene with Dr. Connors talking to his supervisor. Close, but it's gonna take time. He doesn't have time. 
Norman Osborn is dying, Dr. Connors. Save him. I love this as a Spider-Man fan and thought it was so great world building. And it also didn't take a damn scientist to realize what they were doing here is eventually someone's gonna need to create a formula that would turn Norman Osborn into the Green Goblin who would become a villain down the line. And again, that would only be in our imaginations because it was wasted potential. But in the context of this movie, it was a great motive for Dr. Connors to speed up his work so that he doesn't lose his job or the potential for him to regrow his arm someday. Bringing us back to Peter Parker who got caught sneaking around by Gwen Stacy, losing his Oscorp privileges and being kicked out of the building, having us now follow Peter going through the transformation of becoming Spider-Man with encountering some goons on the subway. And these are some evil damn goons. One of them even changes races. Four, please do and I am rather mixed on the transformation scenes that go down with Peter trying to learn how to use his abilities because I do like how he can't manage his strength at first and shoots out the toothpaste really fast, breaks the handle on the sink and has to open the door very carefully. But then it quickly turned very goofy with Peter looking like some sort of mad scientist. Peter putting his abnormal morning to the side to go visit Dr. Connors once again, this time letting him know he's the son of Richard Parker, his once colleague. This is where I want to elaborate a little more on the Dr. Connors character, because while I like the actor who's playing him, and even the lizard himself as a villain, I still am so upset that they deleted so many scenes that really made him feel a lot more human. Throughout the film, you'll see him wear a wedding ring, so we know he's married, and there was a deleted scene that showed he had a kid, which if you read some of the comic storyline, Dr. Connors having a a child and having to battle this double life of being Dr. Connors and the lizard put Spider-Man in a tough position where he wanted to stop the lizard but never wanted to defeat him in a way that would stop Dr. Connors from eventually seeing his family when he goes back to being human. But Peter here thinking he needs to finish what him and his father were doing decides to offer Dr. Connors a formula that would help him complete the genetics research they were doing to fuse together human DNA with animal DNA. Essentially making this Peter Parker create his own villain. Now back in high school Peter is wanting to use his newfound abilities to his advantage and get a little payback. Come on. Still got the moves. Wanting to humiliate Flash, Thompson, and this is what I meant, where this reboot wants to do something different from the Sam Raimi movies, yet it still retreads a lot of the same tropes that they did in that movie. I actually kind of like it because it shows the contrast of how much being a high schooler changes within just 10 years. But now with Peter breaking the backboard of this hoop and getting sent to the principal's office, Uncle Ben has to pay Peter a visit, really doubling down more on how much of an influence Uncle Ben is on the life of Peter Parker and stuff I just love to see like I cannot get enough of the chemistry between the characters here. But this guy, this guy deserved it. Did he? Yeah. You see the kid that hit you? Is he? Yeah. Yeah, but so all this is about getting even. Even how damn likable this Uncle Ben is, who is furious with Peter right now, but still wants to be an embarrassing parent. Yeah. He's got you on his computer. I'm his probation officer. Having us witness more adorable scenes between Peter and Gwen, and it's making me so damn happy to watch. I thought you were someone else. Man, you don't have me on your computer. Uh, yeah, I mean, like, I had, I took a photo of the debate team, and you're in the debate team, so. I, I, so I was touching up stuff. You're touching up stuff? Come on. But now Peter's life is finally taking a turn for the better. He's humiliated his school bully. His school crush is finally showing him some attention. He's got this newfound powers and abilities. He's gonna go test them out. And I love the music, the sequence. You really feel that this kid is just in pure joy. And I don't know what it is about witnessing Spider-Man just test out his powers, seeing him climb up walls, swing a little bit. Just everything that was being put together in this scene, I was getting little tears of joy I really don't understand the people who hate on Andrew Garfield's Spider-Man because I feel the pure passion that comes out of this man's acting when he's Peter Parker. We now find Peter back at Oscorp who is testing out the formula with Dr. Connors hoping that it'll be a success while at the same time ignoring calls from Uncle Ben who asked him to pick up his Aunt May. Bringing us to the point in the Spider-Man movie where now that you've been given these special talents and gifts, you need to learn the lesson that all Spider-Men should. With great power great responsibility. 
Uncle Ben being very upset with Peter that he broke a promise to pick up his Aunt May, demanding he goes apologize to his aunt, and the three-way dynamic that goes on here is so believable and modernized for me. Oh, come on, how dare you? How dare I? How dare you? You keep your fucking voice down. This is it. This is perfect. This is just what you want, isn't it? Get the hell out of here! And when I first watched this movie, I was actually a little disappointed and annoyed that they didn't say the line verbatim. With great power comes great responsibility. Prompting to go with a different direction. And in the end, the message is still the same to where this acting and the response Peter has is so great for character development, I no longer mind it. That if you could do good things for other people, you had a moral obligation to do those things. Not choice responsibility. But here's where Andrew Garfield's abilities just start shining through because when the man is tearing up and talking about his father no longer being here, I am tearing up. I talked about how Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man is so infectious with the way he always picks himself back up whenever he's having a bad day, when other people have pushed him around, but he still has a smile no matter what. It's kind of the other way with Andrew Garfield. When this man is getting emotional, he's getting angry, he's getting teared up, those feelings start latching onto me. And that's why I'll say Andrew Garfield to me is the best actor who's ever played Spider-Man. And that's not me throwing shade at Tobey Maguire or Tom Holland, because I both think they are exceptional actors and do such amazing work outside of just being Spider-Man. And the reason I feel that way, it's because sometimes it's the acting in this movie that saves some of the lesser moments in Amazing Spider-Man. Like, I'm not a huge fan of the transition of how Uncle Ben dies in this film, where Peter goes off to grab milk, but he doesn't have enough money, so the cashier is being rude to him. And then as Peter goes off to leave, the guy gets robbed, and Peter does nothing to help with giving us his version of, I missed the part where that's my problem. Hey, kids, little help. Not my policy. But back to Uncle Ben getting shot, it's just a messy course of events that lead up to it. But as soon as this Peter Parker is witnessing his uncle dying in front of him, bleeding out, his acting makes that entire messy setup of a situation so much more worth it and actually impactful. Uncle Ben, Uncle Ben, someone call an ambulance! Uncle Ben, Uncle Ben. Uh, uh. Oh but now that Amazing Spider-Man has basically checked off the main requirements now for a Spider-Man origin story, it doesn't want to move away from that tragic moment so fast. We kind of live in it with Peter and we're in this dark place with him for a while. Bringing us to more great details in Amazing Spider-Man that I love, like how Flash Thompson wants to go ahead and show his support for losing his uncle and Peter just assuming he's about to be bullied once again. Not today, Flash. Hey, come on, man. I just want to talk. That's better, right? Look, your uncle died. I'm sorry. I get it. I'm sorry. I love that, man. It goes to show you that even though Flash Thompson is Peter's bully, he's not just a straight up evil guy for the sake of being evil. This guy also has a compassionate side. From here, the movie decides to bring us into a montage of Peter going out to look for the man who murdered his uncle, where the movie starts really detailing us the mindset that Peter goes through in becoming Spider-Man to where he realizes he needs to wear a mask, gaining some influence from a wrestling match, another callback to the comics, in what, yes, I completely agree, is the worst homemade suit out of of the entire Spider-Man franchise. I really thought they could have done something cool here, but this is just as basic and generic as it gets. But it is semi-save with Peter tinkering in his basement, creating web shooters, something I'm really happy they introduced in this movie and really differentiates himself from Tobey Maguire's version. Only downside and thing I hate about this is Peter does not develop the web himself. Instead, he is mass ordering the webs from Oscorp and that's his supplier for the web fluid that would be used in his web shooters. I think that is so ridiculously dumb and stupid. Like, isn't somebody at Oscorp noticing that someone is constantly buying web fluid that goes by the name Peter Parker in some random suburban house in New York? Like, they would get suspicious and be like, kid, you've bought 3,000 web cartridges. What for? But putting that minor gripe aside, we do see the impact that Spider-Man is now having on New York City, where it's capturing the attention of Captain Stacy, the father of Gwen Stacy, and a character from the comics that is being brought into this world and what I think is another smart decision for the movie because even though Captain Stacy was in the Sam Raimi universe this version is a lot more involved and has a very impactful role to play on Spider-Man as we go down the line. Bringing us to Peter Parker finalizing his Spider-Man suit that he's created with this really unique POV shot that I think is still a great inclusion for this movie but now that the suit is finally here and revealed in the movie let me go ahead and talk about it because I am conflicted as hell 
on this damn suit right here. But I couldn't help but notice that the head definitely looks like it's some sort of basketball. If you just made the changes of making the eyes white and having the belt connect, I promise you this suit would be in probably my top three, top four Spider-Man suits of all time. Cause under certain lighting in this movie, this suit looks fantastic. Ironically enough, in the first shot, the movie decides to show you of the suit where it should be the big awesome reveal. That lighting looks terrible for this Spider-Man suit. But from other parts of the movie, it looks great. So now with Spider-Man essentially complete, in his costume we see him still going out to find the man who killed his uncle, where we get this Spider-Man quipping. Good thinking, good thinking. Use the window, get out the window. There you go, you got it. Is that a knife? Is that a real okay. knife? Yes, it's a real knife. My weakness, it's small knives. I love Andrew Garfield's jokes as Spider-Man and one of the reasons his version of Spider-Man is my personal favorite is because I think Andrew Garfield really nailed down the jokes and humor that it took to be Spider-Man when he's wearing that mask. But even with Spider-Man catching criminals in New York, the police are not very fond of the webhead where he decides to run away from them. Bring me to another reason why I love The Amazing Spider-Man is they wanted to use as much practical effects as possible to make the movie feel feel real so this entire sequence where Peter is running from the police they created actual rigs and structures so that this version of Spider-Man can actually be swinging in parts of this movie and jumping around and just that tangibility that they are using minimal CGI here and everything that you're seeing is real makes me just have so much damn respect for this movie because I love the swinging in the Andrew Garfield movies I'll say it the Andrew Garfield films have the best Spider-Man swings of any Spider-Man movie speeding forward into the movie a little bit we now cut to Dr. Connors being super pressured to finish his formula or he'll be fired from Oscorp feels he has no other choice but to test the formula on himself while at the same time Peter now a little more happy with his life and feeling confident decides to rekindle his relationship with Gwen Stacy being invited to her house for Branzino. And this is where I love the use of the Captain Stacy character in The Amazing Spider-Man because while you would think Spider-Man is doing good by the city with capturing a bunch of criminals and putting them away, Captain Stacy here makes a good point for why the police are not very happy with Spider-Man. One, because Spider-Man arresting some of these criminals has made them lose a lot of their connections in bringing down some organized crime, but also does not believe the fact that Spider-Man is doing good as every criminal he's catching looks exactly the same, pointing out that Peter actually isn't really doing this to save the city, but more for his own personal agenda, which is not what Spider-Man should be about, teaching him a little lesson in the process. But after that little heated debate, we now find Peter and Gwen on top of the roof where Peter is struggling with the fact on whether to tell Gwen or not that he's Spider-Man, a decision I was not very fond of when I first saw this movie. But thankfully, Spider-Man revealing his identity to Gwen does have an impactful reason for existing and bringing us some character development later on in the film. But now that Peter has revealed his identity to Gwen and smooched her up, his spider senses start tingling and he decides to go to the rescue. And this shot here of Spider-Man on top of the bridge watching the lizard go after his supervisor is exactly what I'm talking about that this suit does look pretty amazing only under certain lighting and mainly nighttime lighting and what follows here with Peter trying to fight the lizard and save a bunch of cars from falling off the bridge this scene was so impactful and beautifully done that I remember they released this before the movie came out to convince audiences that Andrew Garfield will be a great spider-man and in the context of the movie smart move by Sony because this is essentially the birth of Andrew Garfield turning into spider-man gonna make you strong. There you go. That's it. That's it, buddy. That's it. Okay, now climb. No! Saving the little boy, bringing him back to his father, where I once again am swelling up and starting to cry for the fourth time in this damn movie, and Peter Parker's superhero side being born. Spider-Man. And small note there, I want to say I love the theme in Amazing Spider-Man. While I think the Tobey Maguire Danny Elfman theme will be my favorite of all time, the one in Amazing Spider-Man does not get talked about enough. Bringing us to an iconic, beautiful shot of Spider-Man sitting down in his room, reflecting on what he just did and how he helped save a bunch of people for unselfish reasons, realizing exactly what he needs to do with these powers he's been gifted. He even makes that a little more clear when talking to Gwen Stacy the next day at school and saying that he feels it's his responsibility Ability to stop this monster creature. So I, I, I gotta go after it. That's not your job. Maybe it is. 
And I love that that little scene and dialogue was included into the movie because in this current moment, Peter Parker doesn't know right now that the lizard is Dr. Connors and it's kind of his fault that the lizard is out there since he gave him the formula. More details that the Amazing Spider-Man just gets down right. Same way I enjoyed the little detail of Peter actually taking Captain Stacy's advice after he's talked to Dr. Connors and he clearly knows that this man has turned himself into the lizard. Instead of putting on the suit and mask and going after him, he listens to what Captain Stacy told him at that dinner with Gwen and lets the police know exactly what's going down, but of course his story is a little too unbelievable for them. Prompting Peter to take baby steps into working for the Daily Bugle where he wants proof for Captain Stacy, not so much the reward, going out to look for the lizard and take his picture. Bringing us into the third act of the movie where everything it's set up so far can now finally be enjoyed. Starting off with the lizard. At first I was pretty unhappy with the design choice for the lizard since I really like the big old snout, lab coat, and purple pants that the lizard had from the 90s cartoon series, but I quickly grew to like this version of the lizard because he wasn't just a mindless beast. Not only that, but is anyone else super satisfied with the way this man pronounces his P's? Poor Peter Parker. Poor Peter Parker. It's also interesting to me that this movie again went ahead with the Sam Raimi trope of villains where they have a dual personality. Same like with Green Goblin, Dr. Octopus, or Venom. This is again another villain who struggles with a good and bad side overcoming his body. The only major gripe I have about the lizard in this movie is just his overall plan to want to turn other citizens in New York into lizards. That's where the character felt a little exaggerated and goofy for me. But either way, getting on to the action scenes in the final battles of the Amazing Spider-Man, they might not be Sam Raimi level extravagant epic battles, but man do the visual effects really hold up here and that's one thing I'll always praise the Amazing Spider-Man movies for is the visual effects in these films are top notch and I think will probably stand the test of time because they still hold up to this day. And speaking more on Andrew Garfield's version of Spider-Man and his fight style here, it's a little more acrobatic, specifically one moment I love to death is when he's fighting the lizard in his school and he starts putting the lizard in this spider web cocoon, crawling all over him like a spider. I absolutely love that. Leading us now into the final battle of this movie where Peter Parker has learned what the plan is for the lizard, heading to Oscorp in attempt to stop him only to be captured by Captain Stacy in what was really a great tense moment of his identity being revealed to him, especially with knowing how much Captain Stacy is not a fan of Spider-Man. You gotta let me go. And really, what's not to love about the lead up to this final battle here? Because you even have the citizens of New York coming together to help out this version of Spider-Man, something that we would also see time to time from the Tobey Maguire movies. But it's the cinematography and the swinging that Andrew Garfield does here that really makes this feel like a Spider-Man movie. <laughs> It is so damn satisfying seeing Andrew Garfield swing as Spider-Man and even landing on Oscorp Tower and climbing that building. Almost just as satisfying as the final battle between the Lizard and Spider-Man, which I would say is on par with a lot of the epic Sam Raimi fights here just because there's a lot going on. We finally get to see what happens when Spider-Man gets out of commission with his web shooters, even cutting back and forth to some nice POV shots of him almost falling off a building, and the cherry on top, this P-pronouncing Lizard insulting Spider-Man. No mother, no father, no uncle, no third movie. But honestly, it's not even the action in this final battle that nails the ending for a Spider-Man movie. It's the conversation between a dying Captain Stacy and Peter Parker that not only makes me have so much respect for this Spider-Man movie, but really made me look forward to the future of the franchise. You're gonna make enemies. People will get hurt. Sometimes people closest to you. So I want you to promise me something, okay? Leave Gwen out of it. I, to this day, still get chills with that scene and everything Captain Stacy was telling Spider-Man there because I think it applies to all the Spider-Men we will ever have. The reason why you need to wear the mask, the hesitation on having the job that people around you are gonna get hurt, and of course, the consequences and suffering of being a Spider-Man that you can't have what you want, and that includes the love of your life making him promise to stay away from Gwen. A 
emotionally sealing the deal of this scene with Spider-Man just standing on top of Oscorp Tower looking over the city he just saved. Continuing on the tradition of a Spider-Man movie ending off in a funeral to where it looks like Peter Parker is going to want to keep his promise to Captain Stacy to leave Gwen out of it only for the movie to hint to us that it looks like Peter will be breaking that promise. Transitioning us into the final swing where the movie itself even gives us a hint to what will come with Spider-Man having a spider senses tingle right when he's passing the Brooklyn Bridge that would eventually be the fall of Gwen Stacy. Look, I'll never argue with someone who says that the Tobey Maguire Sam Raimi universe movies are better put together, they're tightly paced, they're more better written, but for all the flaws Amazing Spider-Man may have and some of its missteps, everything is made up for with the acting, the chemistry within the characters, and the emotional passion you feel when this movie is playing. It's a movie I'll defend time and time again and also had me really looking forward to what they were going to do with Andrew Garfield's Spider-Man. And well, we'll get on to what happens in his second movie. But those are just my thoughts on The Amazing Spider-Man. I'm going to leave it up to you guys. What did you think of this film? Are you someone who likes the Andrew Garfield version of Spider-Man? Are you someone against this movie? I'd love to hear from both sides. Don't forget to stay tuned for the rest of the Spider-Man reviews. Anything and everything, be sure to like, subscribe, follow me on Twitter at 3C Films or on TikTok at 3C Films. But as always, I'm Chris. Take care.